afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us here. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, this afternoon to be uh, joined by uh, our systems commanders, who I think uh, will provide uh, a very enlightening discussion for you. Um, I have the pleasure now of introducing the panel's moderator, Mr. James McAleese, Principal, McAleese & Associates, PC. Mr. McAleese founded McAleese & Associates in 1992 to provide legal and consulting services to organizations to enable them to maximize value from their contract opportunities. A lifelong interest in military and defense issues, further kindled by an internship with the U.S. Army's Contract Appeals Division early in his career, has established Jim and McAleese & Associates as experts, uh, expert defense industry consultants and analysts. Now a respected authority on the Department of Defense budget process and acquisition cycle, Jim is regularly sought out by DOD and industry decision makers, as well as by the investment community. He comments on, a, on the impact a policy, a policy decision might have and on what strategies might most effectively leverage and impact industry trends. Prior to founding McAleese & Associates, Jim was a practicing attorney in government contracts law based in Washington, D.C. He remains actively involved in several professional organizations, all of which vigorously support the defense and intelligence interests of the United States. Please join me in welcoming Mr. James McAleese. Sir. <clears throat> Hello, can you guys hear me? And the people in the back, oh, I see. Thank you. You can't hear me. Uh, just a couple of quick thoughts. Um, of course, Admiral Daly, General Shea, you have outperformed expectations once again. Um, three things that I really wanted to just kind of set the stage before we then transition into the panel today. Uh, first thing you saw, Admiral, uh, I want to say Secretary Work Brief yesterday, uh, you heard him use the, the analogy of the Python, right? Uh, I know he was probably very careful not to give you a projection on sequester, but, but I am going to give you a, a what I think we're going to see in terms of the 2016. Um, I think we are going to see a last minute 2016 sequester deal number one. As far as timing is concerned, I think we're going to see it late in the year. Uh, I think it's going to be a nail biter. Uh, I, there's no doubt in my mind that we're not going to get all $34 billion of extra uh, 2016 above sequester funding that we have asked for. Uh, what I think we're probably going to get, what you should prepare yourself for from a programmatic perspective, is probably going to be somewhere in the ballpark of 30 cents to about 50 cents on the dollar. And that will, will fundamentally result probably in about a 13 to a 19 billion dollar top line increase for 2016, which as it feeds through to the modernization accounts that, that Secretary Work was talking about yesterday that are so critical to his third offset strategy, that should result in approximately about a 4 to 6% increase in the 2016 modernization. So if this happens, it's great news from my perspective, number one. Number two, a couple thoughts about the 2016 budget, sir. Um, and, and just a thought, um, clearly what we're going to see is we're going to see a significant expansion of the SCN account. She's already at about $17 billion. She's going to grow to about $20 billion per year. Um, that's great news. Um, obviously, I'm a little concerned about the APN account by default. That's probably going to cap the APN out at about $15 billion per year. We're starting to see some of the tightening up in the weapons procurement account this year, literally as we speak. Uh, I would tell you by about 2019 to really start watching the budget because that's the first year where we're really going to start. So when Secretary Work talked about the nuclear enterprise, that's the first time where we're really going to start seeing the SSBNX really emerge. Okay. Um, let me transition to our, our panel today. I thought we would start with Admiral Vlardis from NAVC. I know that, that those of you who know him, he is a red meat kind of guy. He loves the programmatics. I'm fairly confident by the time we get done with the Q&A, he's probably already standing up speaking, I just don't know it. I can't tell whether he's going to be wrestling with the GW, wrestling with SSBNX, or wrestling with how to get the railgun on the third Zumwalt, but I'm fairly confident that's going to come up. Admiral Dunaway uh, from NAV Air probably is going to come at it from a little more of a structural. Uh, his discussions really have been about the integrated warfare capability. How do I bring that lethality to the fleet, the survivability to the fleet, the combat capability to the fleet, and also the open systems architecture modularity. How does he keep re reinforcing and upgrading the lethality of the fleet as we go along? 
We're going to transition to someone who needs no introduction, literally in his own auditorium. Uh, and the two things that I think are probably most important I really want to hear today. Number one is going to be the program execution. Sir, this is obviously not what we discussed over the phone. Uh, a completely different <coughs> agenda has emerged. But the program execution that has really improved in terms of spa war, particularly the, the name that I always hear in DC every day is Keynes. <coughs> What's the combat capability? What's worked? What didn't work? But, but how has that program emerged as this tremendous lightning rod for success? And separately, of course, is going to be the cyber. Okay? We're then going to transition to General Schrader. Uh, I know he's got strong feelings. They vary from Expeditionary Force 21 uh, all the way over to his portfolio. He's got about 450 programs that he's got to work with every day. But when I look at his portfolio, the heart and soul I really see is the communications and electronics portfolio because that's where he's putting his money today. Last but not least, we're going to transition to the Coast Guard. Admiral Baffer, as you know, is the Assistant Commandant, uh, Surface Warfare Officer. He's commanded several of his own cutters. Um, about half of the billion dollars that he's spending in the 2016 budget request for acquisition is focused on surface assets, capital assets. And I'm very confident that the program that will keep coming up again and again today is going to be the Offshore Patrol Cutter, OPC. Please join me in welcoming our CISCOM panel. So I'm uh, looking for some red, some red meat, of course. Uh, I, I, uh, the, the, the title of the panel leads you to have me talk mostly about what my PEOs do. But just quickly, to remind you the rest of NAVC's portfolio, uh, four public shipyards. I think I saw Steve Williamson, one of our great shipyard commanders here, with uh, more than 30,000 government employees who still turn wrenches and operate welding torches. Uh, four regional maintenance centers, including one that uh, was just established in Naples with detachments in Rhoda and Bahrain that do the predominance of the contracting and oversight of our surface ship maintenance and modernization. Ten warfare center divisions, and many of you are familiar with a few of them. Uh, between the ten, almost 20,000 folks who do the predominance of the R&D and development work for our ships and many of the other systems around the fleet. Uh, and then a, a bunch of cats and dogs, uh, uh, explosive ordnance disposal, uh, ordnance safety, et cetera. Uh, when I look at the aircraft carriers and, and what the PEOs, are, you know, the PEOs and what they're going to do over the next few years, front and center, of course, is getting Ford delivered. Uh, a reminder, the Ford is the first new class of aircraft carrier in nearly 50 years. It has a set of technologies new technologies, a brand new reactor plant, brand new electrical distribution. It's got a new catapult system designed to give a modern airplane a modern ride. A new arresting gear to do the same thing on the, on the, when you're coming back aboard. A brand new set of radars that are developmental as they go into that aircraft carrier. Uh, and a series of other technologies including uh, a complete change to the way we do elevators around the ship. Uh, those challenges are, are bearing out right now as the ship uh, nears completion of the construction and is in the activation sequence. Happy to report that the catapult testing has gone particularly well and uh, we'll be watching very closely that test program as it goes on. And I'm very confident that ship will be at sea in early 2016, uh, proven that we made the right decisions with those technologies. Uh, as a note, uh, you may have seen the, the uh, George Washington refueling is now officially under contract. Uh, that contract was announced recently. And uh, so in from the carrier business, pretty solid ground there. Uh, PO Submarine's got a pretty heavy load on his plate. Uh, uh, this will be, it is likely that 15 will be the first year we deliver two SSNs that were procured in the same year in one year. Uh, it'll be close, whether it's December or January. But uh, being personally invested in that, I'm happy to see that come to fruition. You also see in the budget uh, the advanced uh, design for a payload module to go into Virginia class, which is how we're going to recapitalize those SSGNs. Uh, the SSGN has been particularly useful around the world for the last 15 years, and we will miss those 22 missile tubes when they go out of service starting in 2025. And of course, the elephant in the shipbuilding room is the Ohio replacement. Uh, lots being written and said about it, and I can tell you that we have had the uh, most uh, robust discussion about requirements and cost at this point in a ship design uh, as it's possible to have, and uh, I believe we have the requirement right, and we are uh, in the middle of uh, a significant design effort that includes uh, 
just like the carrier, new reactor, uh, significant new uh, uh, systems associated with the, uh, the uh, ship's uh, silencing. And then, uh, of course, a restart of a missile tube industrial vase that has been, been dormant since the early 80s. Uh, on the, uh, the PEO uh, LCS front, and uh, we have not changed the name yet, but uh, I think uh, Secretary made it clear that the uh, last 20 ships of that class will be called frigates. Uh, we have established a new program office, PMS 515, uh, to manage that program. And they have a very tight timeline, about six months, to lock down the, the uh, entering arguments for that design so that we can meet the 2019 construction start for the, uh, the third variant uh, frigates uh, in that, uh, and from LPO, LCS. Uh, also, uh, uh, independence with a full mine mission module uh, transited the Panama Canal uh, three days ago, is on its way to Panama City, and uh, will prove out that that mine mission module is dramatically better than the mine capabilities on our current mine countermeasure <laughs> ships. And I always remind people, the ships that LCS is replacing in the short term are Avenger-class mine sweepers and, and Cyclone-class PCs. So they're going to replace the minesweepers and going to replace the PCs. And I don't know many people tell you that's not a significant upgrade from those two classes of ships. Uh, by the time they get around to doing all the missions that frigates do, I think we're going to find their fine ships and we'll, we'll be getting a lot of use out of them. I will note that I'm leaving tomorrow morning to go out to Singapore. Fort Worth is uh, doing her first crew turnover as uh, part of her deployment. and. Uh, it didn't make any news article anywhere, but there was only a single Cat 3 CAS rep in her first 90 days on station. That's not news, right? The previous deployment, that wasn't quite the same story, but I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be sad to see that in the newspaper. Uh, PO ships, very, very diverse portfolio, and uh, for those of you that have seen the, the puller, that is a magnificent ship that's different than anything we built uh, in, in recent memory. Uh, that's in their portfolio. Of course, their big item this year will be the Zumwalt. Uh, Zumwalt's activation is proved, proven to be particularly challenging. Again, a lot of new technology, first ofs in that ship. Uh, but I expect to see Zumwalt sailing down the Kennebec uh, by the end of the year as we uh, start the trials process uh, to get her to delivery. Uh, DDG 51 restart uh, has, been, uh, has been a good challenge for us. Uh, stop that construction program. We proved once again why you should not stop construction in the middle of a construction run and then restart it. So there's, uh, there's some, some uh, new learning going on there. And of course, the Flight 3 DDGs with the Advanced Missile Defense Radar will be uh, starting up here in uh, FY16. Uh, from the uh, PEO IWS, I'll say it's the forgotten, uh, the forgotten PEO inside the NAVC portfolio. Uh, IWS uh, doesn't really like my logo very well. It's all about the ships. That's what we've been using. So they've created a new one. We make them warships. So that's, the, uh, that's what IWS does. Uh, that's an incredibly diverse portfolio. And uh, they are out right now proving out the Baseline 9 destroyer and cruiser systems uh, with some of the most complex uh, target scenarios that are possible. And I think you'll be hearing a lot about that in the near future the success of that uh, Baseline 9 uh, ship. I'll just close. Uh, we spent a lot of time, the three of us have spent a lot of time together in recent memory talking about cybersecurity and all the things on board our ship that, that deal with ones and our ships and planes that deal with ones and zeros. Uh, all three of us are, are manning up to this challenge to go design into our systems uh, cybersecurity from the ground up. And it's uh, incumbent upon us to, to write the specs and standards that we put in our contracts, you all will know what to build for us. And then I'll just uh, finish with uh, number one challenge is people. Uh, across my enterprise, uh, we're hiring uh, some for attrition, some for uh, increases in end strength, uh, like at our public shipyards, and we are in a war for people. Uh, uh, getting good people in the government uh, will continue to be a challenge, getting them through all the all the wickets to go get into the government, and we are not as agile as you are in getting those uh, folks in our door. And so uh, I spend most of my time on people, which I think is where someone in my position should spend his time. So thanks. Over to you, Decoy. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to talk as much about stuff as I am going to talk about how we use the stuff and implement it. 
Um, so a syscom really does design, develop, verification, validation, sustainment, and in my case, all things naval aviation. Uh, we do that through working with our sponsors for requirements clarification, requirements analysis. That's a big part of our work. Uh, we do it through uh, putting 24,000 contracts out per year from uh, the Naval Air Systems Command. And we do it through the exercise of tech standards and tech authority through our CEDAR process, systems engineering technical review process. That's the tools of how we get something out of the products uh, that our great industry partners are delivering it to us. Uh, the result is a whole series of platforms, weapons, networks, and sensors that we use to do the nation's bidding uh, from a naval aviation perspective. I just am burdened with doing math, and as I do math and I project out just an index for the things that we need to buy to do the missions into the future, the current cost profile is prohibitive. It is a going out of business profile if we don't reset how we price and cost and implement technology and take things into the future. There has to be a shift in the way that we procure these items. Um, and, and I'm, you know, I've done a, the DOD 5000 rewrite in my career, I don't know, four or five times. And I'm not sure that rewriting that again is going to solve the problem. I think it's uh, really from a Syscom perspective, how we implement these tech standards, tech authorities, derived, how we manage the derived requirements, how we write the contracts, how we write the, help write the requirements and analyze the requirements. We don't write requirements, so we help analyze the requirements. That to me is one of the keys that's going to make a big difference in whether we can afford our future or just continue the downsizing of our force. Um, so from the requirements perspective, <clears throat> for years we've taken the JROC process and devolved requirements into stovepipe, ultimately in a single platform weapon network or sensor. It's a, it's a subset of the full system that the warfighter wants. Uh, and to quote uh, Admiral Gordney, we fight like a carrier strike. We don't fight, fight like an F-18 or an H-60 run. We don't fight like those. We fight like a carrier strike group. And so it's, it's not uh, very smart to believe that if you're only trying to procure and develop one element, <laughs> that it's going to work in the system system element environment. And so we're spending a lot of time within NAVAIR teaching ourselves how to do that systems of systems requirements flow, systems of systems contract writing, how do you write a contract that says your system has to show up and work in this environment? Um, and we have had interoperabilities at KPP. We've had little bits and pieces of this, but it's wholly inadequate. It's a very necessary part, but wholly inadequate. It's not until you get the documentation right, till you get the people right, till you get the infrastructure right, that you can do the system of system systems engineering that's required to manage the derived requirements, which is the thing that makes things show up interoperable and working in the fleet. It's very much what PEO IWS does. It's very much what SPAWAR provides as a backbone for us to exercise on. And it's very much what NAVAIR produces. And we're making a lot of progress amongst the three of us of working these horizontally integrated threads. At the same time, we're satisfying Title 10 vertical stovepipe funding of programs or record. And we do that uh, through the exercise of those three areas, requirements, contracts, tech standards, tech authority. Um, so we at NAVAIR have established what we call an integrated warfighting capability competency. Uh, I, am, I am writing tech standards right now for warfighting capabilities. We have done it through the AW arena in NIFCA. We have the full standard from find, fix, track, target to engage and assess. It's very detailed. It's very complicated. It's very hard. People said you can't do it. I don't agree. We've done it. You can do it. And that really helps the individual systems show up and uh, show up to the fleet in a fashion that makes them compatible with all the other systems they've got to deal with. Uh, like Willie, a big part of the challenge is people and getting ourselves out of the mentality of linear up and down stovepipe uh, work that we've been confining ourselves to for years. Um, a second big part of the problem is data, data rights. We, have, we as the United States government have not exercised our data rights well. Uh, and so consequently, we don't have the data. And to get it out of a, a contracting system that produced it maybe 8, 10, 12 years ago, it's archaic, it's not compatible, it's difficult to get. So we've got to get a lot smarter on, uh, smarter on how we exercise our data rights so that we can ensure the compatibility across proprietary boundaries that are inherent to buying systems. So real quickly, this is how it's manifesting itself in the Syscom at NAVAIR so that you might be seeing it. Um, in the near term, we're doing something called AirWorks, akin to a Phantom Works or a Skunk Works. 
where we're actually trying to get latent capability out of existing systems. We're cordoning off part of our organization, uh, full spectrum from engineering to logistics to test and evaluation, to try and support the fleet on near-term problems that they're having that you're never going to get into the pump process fast enough. It's an emergent requirement. Uh, one of the things that has been front and center on everybody's mind is, uh, this is a good example, is the uh, notion that SUW is a real problem right now. We need an SUW weapon. There's a lot of work in the future years, but something's got to happen right now. And when you look at it from a system to systems perspective, as we've just recently done with the Tomahawk Block 4, you find that we can actually fly one of those into the side of a ship as we did on the 27th of January this year. That is simply engineering. I did it with training money and about 10 people. Right? It's not that hard to do when you pay attention to the horizontal thread by getting yourself confined to the vertical stovepipe. In the midterm, it's delivering on programs of record. And we're going to have to get smarter at how we pull our, require, our data rights through these contracts and how we exercise across proprietary boundaries. That's something I want to work very closely with industry on because I do not want to uh, inhibit the competitive environment. I don't want to uh, inhibit the intellectual capital that's in our great industry partners from coming forth through their IRAD. That is a fantastic thing. But where we don't need to exercise proprietary boundaries, we need to stop. That is cost that is just taking equipment out of the system. And we need help working with you on figuring out where that is. In the midterm, the kinds of technologies that we can insert that are going to take cost out of the system may or may not cost a lot of money, but that's the way we have to think as we go forward. Things that we've implemented recently are things like uh, Magic Carpet, which is basically just a uh, flight path control system for how you land on the aircraft carrier, and it's made it exceptionally so easy that Willie Hilardis could do it. Now that's <laughs> saying a lot uh, on how you do it. So it, basically it, it takes a lot of the corrections that the pilots had made for years, taking them out of his hands, and really simplified the way he lands. That means he won't have to practice as much at the field. If he doesn't have to practice as much at the field, those are hours and sorties that we can now put into the training process. Synthetic training is another one. The ability to scab a open architected processor on the outside of our existing infrastructure is going to allow us to inject training into the cockpit so you won't have to launch adversary aircraft or launch F-18s to go against F-18s to get radar training. That's a tremendous amount of money that can come out of the system and be turned right back into the system for future warfighting capabilities or training for uh, folks that they need. Uh, and I really think the concept of getting open architected processors on the outside of our closed system is going to be real important for us, and that's an area I'm putting a lot of energy into. The last thing in the midterm I talk about is the digital thread um, for additive manufacturing. Well, what do I mean by that, right? The digital thread goes from the uh, design drawings um, through the CAD CAM system into a package that has all the necessary metadata so that years from now we have an archive of what every part on every airplane looks like. We're suffering heavily right now trying to reproduce parts with two-dimensional drawings from old P3 days or um, 585-90 formers on an F-18 that nobody thought would ever crack or break, but when you take it to twice its service life, they do crack and break. So we're having to reinvent these parts and it takes a long time to do that. This concept of controlling the digital threat on parts and standardizing that across industry, I think is the key to our future and sustainment and making sure that it's affordable. And we've got to put our back into that. It will play into subtractive manufacturing and it will play into additive manufacturing where there's another, uh, I think, real potential for savings as we sustain an aging fleet and trying to get more hours out of our, our airplanes. In the long term, so I've been through the short mid, and as I look out to the long term, I think open architecture is going to be our modernization key. We've done it on the submarine force with ARCHI. We've done it in the surface force. Uh, aviation's carrying a lot of different type model series and infrastructure. We have pieces and parts showing up, like Joint Strike Fighter is largely open, but it's got a proprietary twist to it, so it's not fully open and commercial, but we're headed that direction. And when we get to fully open architecture from a hardware perspective and software perspective, we're going to be able to modernize these platforms a lot quicker like we need to do. And I think that's going to be real important. Last point I'll make, um, as did Willie, is that cyber is here. Uh, I pay a lot of close attention to it right now, just like everybody else here at the front of the room. There is a 
a tremendous amount of uniqueness that goes with our massive platforms. And I think aviation gets the award for being the most unique um, in that we spend a lot of time in cyber talking about networks. And a network's fantastic, plugging into the gig, that is a real important part of this. But internal to my aircraft, I cannot use conventional uh, network defense techniques because of the specificity of my network in the airplane. It doesn't work. So there's a whole new set of techniques and procedures that we're going to have to develop for platform um, IT that we, aren't, that we can't get from the cyber network IT world. It's different. And we're, we're getting our game on and we're starting to figure that out, but there's a lot that's going to be done there. Uh, and I think that's going to give us a great defensive as well as offensive capability in the future. That's it. Well done. When I was coming into this job, uh, Admiral Gordon, he told me, there might have been a thousand other people in the room, but he told me uh, that I needed to do, a new commander needed two things. He needed good C2 and uh, clear commander's intent. Uh, so I'm an echelon two, report directly to CNO, that's adequate C2. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to talk today about commanders in, my commander's intent. Uh, the first thing uh, was promise is a commitment. Uh, Jamie talked about Keynes. Uh, early on in the Keynes process, we weren't exactly sure how long it was going to take to do the installation, so we made a commitment. Uh, we made a promise, which turned out not to be a commitment. Uh, as we've gotten through that, uh, we now know how long it takes to put canes on a ship, and we now meet those commitments or beat them. So there's 17 canes installed, canes ships in service today. Uh, there are 11 uh, being installed, Kevin, 11 cane systems being installed today, and they're all on schedule. Uh, they're all working within the, uh, being accomplished within the CNO milestones. And, and that's a tribute to a lot of hard work uh, by individuals on the deck plates, uh, with my uh, NAFC and fleet brethren, uh, to make all that happen. Uh, so now we have to just continue that. We only have about 150 systems to go, and, uh, and we're good, and then we're done. Uh, <laughs> but uh, again, the, the fleet hat with uh, OFRP, the fleet has a hard, uh, hard stop on schedules, and we have to meet that. Now, the flip side of that is don't make the commitment if you can't do it. So there's an agreement part at the front end, so uh, a promise cannot be made casually. So there's an opportunity to have a discussion about, well, the fleet needs it in 30 days, but you can't possibly get it done less than 45. Well, then it's not going on the ship. Uh, and there, there's some allowance for risk in there, but that's a discussion that's allowed to have up front. But once we've agreed to 45 days, then it's 45 days, period. Uh, and uh, I think we're, we're doing pretty well on that. Uh, the next part is, uh, and, and this is the third time you hear this, you may hear it more, uh, cyber is an all hands on deck evolution for us and frankly for everybody. If your machine has a computer in it, you got to be cyber an expert. I was in Home Depot the other day and I saw a light bulb with an IP address. You got to be a cyber expert. Uh, there's, uh, I think it's, uh, it'll be on our website, Space War website, a nice open source article on hacking your car. Uh, if you don't know anything about cyber, I recommend you read that, okay? Uh, it will terrify you, but it get, does give you an idea of the scope. So this is a key fob to my car. If my car has been hacked and I lock, unlock, unlock, that's a one, zero, zero. That's a, bi that's a binary four. If I have malicious code in the car, and I've told it when you see lock, unlock, unlock, do something, it will. Like lock up the right front brake at 70 miles an hour. Uh, so uh, just to give you an idea how clever those folks are and the kind of stuff that they can do. Uh, and uh, so we need to pay attention to that across the board. Um, lastly, uh, there's opportunity in adversity. Uh, when I look at, um, I, I like Navy history, technology history. Uh, when I look back, when were aircraft carriers matured in the Navy? In the interwar years, when the Navy didn't have a nickel to its name. Uh, when did the Marines come up with amphibious warfare? Interwar years, uh, when there weren't very many Marines. 
when did submarines uh, first become uh, highly capable? Uh, and when did we build the submarines that won the most effective submarine war in the history of time? That was in the interwar years. Uh, when did nuclear power come to submarines after World War II, uh, when there was no money? When did uh, surface missile systems, uh, when did they come to the fore after World War II, when there was no money? Uh, when did Aegis come out after Vietnam, uh, when there was no money? When did the F-18 come out after Vietnam, when there was no money? So uh, this is our opportunity, this is our time to really innovate. So the things that Secretary Walker is saying, I am, uh, I am all in on that. Uh, this is a great time to really sit down and think about how we do business. Cyber uh, is a burning bush issue, uh, and it should cause us to look at our networks and our systems uh, in a different way. Uh, what we have on the ships today, what we have out in the world today, it was a grown organically without consideration of cyber. So we really need to look at that and decide what we're going to do. Um, so the things we're looking at, and it's Bay War in that area, modularity, I absolutely echo uh, what Errol Dunaway said on modularity. That is the way to speed to the fleet. If we have to use a cutting torch uh, to put stuff on the ship, then, uh, then, then we're doing something wrong. Uh, it ought to be, just like you have sitting in your pocket today, probably a phone, and that's a soft piece of software that gets installed that brings, up, uh, brings a new capability to the ship. Uh, that's the quickest way to do it. Uh, cutting torches require money, money requires budget, budget requires palms and fit-ups and all that stuff, and, uh, and that slows the process down. Um, other areas, common surface radio room. We've talked about common submarine. We've implemented common submarine radio room. I think we need to do the same thing on the service ships. It's a different kind of problem. It's a, it's a scoping or scaling issue, uh, but it's something we can fix. Uh, reduce C4I baselines. Uh, it's been said every ship has a unique baseline uh, for C4I. That's pretty close to true. Uh, I see Admiral Hunt laughing in the second row there. Um, so we need to reduce that. And part of that is consolidating product lines. We're really good at buying new things. We're terrible at throwing away old things. Uh, I've been in the Navy uh, a little while. And in my time in the Navy, we have eliminated one CPU that was in service in 1979 when I entered the Navy. And that's a CP642 Bravo. Everything else we have had then is still in service today. Everything. So uh, that's probably not a thing to be proud of. Um, and, uh, and Keynes is a good example of both modularity and eliminating product lines. That is, in fact, a private cloud. That's what Keynes is. Uh, and I give a lot of credit, I've said this before today, so I apologize if you heard it, but I give a lot of credit to people back in 2007, 2008 that were inventing a private cloud when all of us thought rain is what came out of clouds. We had never heard the term before. So in Keynes, we have a, an a system that can take applications as a, as a software-only upgrade and substantially improve the capability ship within the Keynes envelope uh, for the price of a CD or even a... Uh, or a uh, over-the-air change. So tremendous capability there. That needs to be expanded, and I agree absolutely, beyond uh, what's currently in Keynes and into, into our other systems. And lastly, an area we're looking strong, uh, closely at uh, Spay War is in-service engineering agents. Uh, they, they really cover the gamut of everything that's uh, in service. We tend to think of them, uh, I call big E engineering in service agents, uh, look at the engineering. But the reality is, I think the ICA should also be looking at training, at people, at manning, the uh, logistics side. They should really be looking at the ships holistically from, a, from the perspective of performance of their assigned systems. So that the reason it breaks is not always a material problem. Have we properly trained the sailor? Have we given them the right tools? Uh, if the ship is rated to have three uh, second class petty officers, NECs, and they have one third class petty officer, an NEC, and two quad zeros, even if you're perfect materially, the chances are the system's not going to work very well. And I think the ISCA needs to know that so that they can provide that particular ship a little bit more help if they need it, uh, or inform the uh, type commander that, hey, there's an issue over there on that ship. You may not be paying attention to it, but I know it because I'm the ISCA, and, and you, we need to give that ship a little bit more love than maybe, uh, maybe the other ship across the pier. So that uh, concludes my remarks. Thank you. So good afternoon. Sir, I got to tell you, your, your story about having your vehicle hacked 
you know, makes me glad. I've got an old F-150. It's got the push down <laughs> locks and the crank yes, handles. I'm going to keep the vehicle. So, <laughs> 100, 120, it won't do 120 miles an hour. It might do 70. So, but, um, so I'm just going to talk just very briefly about the Commandant's planning guidance. General Dun Dunford just put out his planning guidance last month, really focuses us. Uh, also, Expeditionary Force 21, and then I'm going to talk about six areas that uh, we're, we're capability areas that we're focused on that nest within those two pieces of guidance that have been put out there. So, when General Dunford released his planning guidance last month, it's entitled Innovate, Adapt, and Win. He wrote that the Corps is adequately equipped. He praised our Marines for their performance in Afghanistan, Libya, Pacific, and other places around the world. But I got to tell you, while our performance today indeed speaks for itself, the Commandant acknowledged that we still have much work to do to be ready for tomorrow's challenges. In his guidance under a section where he addresses exercising and experimenting with a focus on naval integration, uh, the Commandant directs that our service level exercises for 2015 and 2016 are going to focus on uh, the A280 environment, the anti-access, anti-denial environment. He identifies in his end state partially to be fight with what we have today to inform our capabilities that we need for tomorrow. And I think that's, that's uh, pretty wise. So, and also in conjunction with the Commandant's guidance, uh, we've got Expeditionary Force 21. It's been out there for a while, and if you follow the Marine Corps at all, I'm sure you've seen it and read it. But it's our capstone amphibious operations document that is charting a course for us over the next at least decade to fill the Marine Corps that will be the right force, the right place, the right time. Expeditionary force and readiness. It's an actionable plan to support our operational concepts for ship to objective maneuver and operational maneuver from the sea. So with that all in mind, I'm, I want to go back to the question that we've been asked to address today. What will the CISCOMs deliver? At Marine Corps Systems Command, we're working on those on six areas that I'm going to talk just briefly about. And the first one is fires. Um, so if you look at OMFTS and, and uh, ship to objective maneuver, we're talking about increasing operational range and also precision. Fires is, is integral to that. We've got to get that, the, the, the ability to reach out further than we do right now. We've just completed fielding the expeditionary fire support system, which is a rifle 120 millimeter mortar. And now we're working on a precision munition that's going to be GPS guided. And it's also going to extend the conventional range of a mortar from 8 kilometers out to 16 kilometers threshold and 20 kilometers objective. We're in the test phase of that round now, and I'm really excited about that. We're also looking at some other innovations uh, within fires, the high Mars rocket system. Uh, we're looking at the possibility of shooting that system off of a sea, bla off of a sea base uh, platform to, to support forces ashore. And uh, also the 777 howitzer. We keep working on uh, munitions also to increase precision and range for that system. The next area is uh, command and control on the move. Um, network on the move is the program, but it's really about command and control on the move or being able to adjust to real-time changes on the operational battlefield. Network on the move gives the Marine Corps a C2 capability we've never had before, whether on land or at sea. In the past, we've been tethered to a stationary combat operations center. NOTAM or network on the move allows us to further develop our expeditionary mover and war fighting capabilities. If you were uh, here earlier today, you would have heard Major General Nicholson, who was the 1st Marine Division CP, uh, CG, he talked a little bit about an ex exercise that they just performed off the coast on San Clemente Island, which I think gets to the heart of this command and control on the move. If I could describe to you very briefly what he said was, it was a raid force. They had a raid force commander, captain. They gave him a mission uh, to conduct a raid. He did the planning for it. The captain did the planning for it, issued his plan, loaded his Marines on V-22s. They lifted off. When they lifted off in flight, they went and they changed the disposition of the enemy. And then they pushed that change, the intel, to the captain while he was in flight. So the captain had to get that intel. He had to get the change in the enemy disposition. He had to come up with a new plan. And then he had to disseminate that new plan among the aircraft that were flying out there and then execute that mission when he got on the ground. I mean, that's what we're talking about, about C2 on the move, being able to do that through NOTAM and through the capabilities that we're putting out there today. It is a dynamic think we've, We're fighting a dynamic thinking enemy, and we've got to be able to adjust real time to his changes. The next area is within Expeditionary Force 21. That, that capstone document talks about 
forward deploying a MEB command element so that when it gets on the ground, it can then be already regionally oriented and composite forces that are within that region that are also regionally oriented and then uh, be ready to execute as a MEP and even build up capability or the enabling force for a joint task force headquarters. So the MEP command element building up to a joint task force command element and uh, the, the C2 and the C4 systems actually that enable us to do that. That's another area. Cyber, cyber systems. You know, I've been in the job since July, and there, I can't think of a day that's gone by since I got in there that I don't spend at least an hour somewhere talking about cyber. Every day, determined adversaries attack and seek to compromise our networks. Nearly everything my information systems and infrastructure program office is doing right now, from hardware to software to contract labor, falls into the cyber realm. The Marine Corps is working right now 118 cyber projects, small projects up to the large projects, but 118 cyber projects. And they require collaboration across multiple entities. Marfor Cyber, which is now Two Star Command, C4, Brigadier General Nally at the headquarters, MCICOM, Major General Ayala, who is uh, over all of our installations, and us at Marfor Syscom. So, so four flag level commands working cyber uh, in conjunction. Cyber is, is a growth industry. The next area is our live virtual constructive training environments. In the Commandant's uh, planning guidance, his intent is that Marines encounter initial tactical and ethical dilemmas in a simulated battlefield before they have to face them on actual com in actual combat. Makes sense. We've been, we've been doing that for a long time. But the Commandant says in his planning guidance he wants to really look at our return on investment and making the connection between live virtual constructive systems and our training and readiness manuals. They already do that. They've broken the code on the air side of the house when it comes to qualifications. You gotta spend so much time within simulators. We're looking to make sure that we, we're looking to do that on the ground side. Tie it to our training and readiness standards and get a lot of the most in, uh, return on investment that we can from our live virtual constructive training environments and, and systems. The last area is our ground combat tactical vehicles, or our ground, talk, ground combat tactical vehicle strategy. I'll just talk about two programs. I think everybody out there is aware that, that the Marine Corps is going after an amphibious combat vehicle. The program right now, the increment of the program is called ACV 1.1. It's an eight-wheeled amphibious personnel carrier, if you will. Um, it's not a replacement to the AAV right now. It's gonna enhance that capability. Uh, just real quickly, we're looking at a March uh, RFP release. I think they've put maybe two or three. The PEO Land Systems manages this program. They've put two or three draft RFPs out on the street, gotten industry feedback. We're looking for a final release in the March time frame. Driving toward a EMD contract award November, December, where we're going to award two EMD contracts, 16 EMD uh, system each for a total of 30, 32 systems to take into test. We're also upgrading the AAV that we have. Survivability, mobility, and maintainability of that system, we're looking at upgrading about 390 systems of that 1,200 vehicle fleet. That program is alive and well and doing well. I think um, within the next couple of weeks, you're gonna hear of, of a uh, contract award. They're in source selection right now for the upgrade. And lastly is in the AAV or ACV capability, we're still we still have an increment called ACV 2.0, which is we're still exploring the high water speed capability, determining whether it's still required. If it is required, we'll chase it. If not, um, we'll go off in another direction. But I think that ACV 1.1 is going to help inform what we do with 2.0 and going forward, along with connectors and along with the amphibs uh, and the amphibious strategy for STOM and ONFTS. <laughs> The last thing is JLTV. JLTV is right now in source selection with the PEO. That program is doing well. Um, because it's in source selection, I think that's, that's probably about all I should say about it. So those six areas, if I could tell you what we're delivering, those six areas, fires, command and control on the move, the MEB command element, being able to forward deploy within 12 to 24 hours, ground combat tactical vehicle strategy, ACB 1.1, and um, the AV upgrade and JLTV, and then live virtual constructive training uh, environment. 
So I'll close with just telling you, you know, being the commanding officer of Marine Corps Systems Command is, is really a privilege and it's an honor, and I'm, I'm learning every day uh, since I got in the job. I, and I tell you, striking a balance between readiness and modernization, is, it's a huge challenge. And my program managers and program offices try to find that balance every day. It's all about risk. We need to find innovative ways to maintain our platforms, be very selective, and take some risk, especially given the uncertain budget environment today. I think that's it. So with that, I'll turn it over to Admiral Baffert. Thank you. First, let me just say it's, a, it's an honor to be part of this distinguished panel up here. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm in charge of the Coast Guard Acquisition Director. We don't have a syscom, uh, so we take care of all cutters, boats, aircraft, and computer systems, uh, which works for us because when we've got a hard computer problem, we go to Spay War. We've got a really hard uh, naval engineering problem, we go to Nav C. And when we've got a hard aircraft problem, we go to Nav Air. Uh, it's the right thing for the uh, U.S. taxpayer, and frankly, we can't afford to recreate the wheel. So. Usually when we have a hard problem, we go to the Navy and we find out that uh, they're either working on it or they already solved it. So we, we sign an MOU, we call it a partnership, and then we steal them when they're not looking. You know, But uh, uh, a lot of the success we have had has been through Navy partnerships, and uh, I just want to publicly say thank you for the, for the, for the efforts and uh, for hooking us up. Uh, as you know, the uh, Coast Guard's in the uh, uh, midst of a major recapitalization of all of our cutters, boats, and aircraft. And when the question is, okay, what, what are you delivering? Well, we're delivering affordable capability. Uh, the challenge that we've got is demand for Coast Guard services is, is going up. The trend line is definitely up. Uh, Kaufman is underway right now in the last FFG deployment, uh, doing EastPAC, doing a drug mission. Uh, that's the last FFG and the last FFG deployment. So uh, there's a lot more demand for Coast Guard cutters in the Western Hemisphere as the Navy pivots to the Pacific for doing drug interdiction, doing some of the some of the things closer to home that we've typically uh, used some of the Navy platforms for. So our demand signal's going up. At the same time, our recapitalization budget's going down. Our 210-foot cutters just turned 50 years old. Uh, we've got 14 of those, and 50 years old is a long time to be sitting in salt water. Some of those are gonna self-decommission real soon. Um, <laughs> our 270-foot cutters are over 30 years old now, and uh, they've been through a midlife, and. Uh, you know, they've got a few more years left on them, but uh, keeping them modernized and, and uh, relevant to today's mission is, is a constant challenge as well. But our challenge is to close that gap, in the, and, and the way we're going to close that capability gap between the demand and our budgets is uh, through affordability. And we're doing that with a back-to-basics acquisition approach. We've gotten rid of those fancy contracts that you've spoken about at lunch. Uh, I heard about the, the fancy things where you stable state of the market requirements, not state of the art, state of the market. We use fixed price contracts and we depend on competition. We use competition to enforce good behavior. We're using uh, better buying power. And the best part about betting buy, better buying power is it's a DOD program. So it doesn't apply to the Coast Guard and DHS, which means we've got no reporting requirements. We can use the pieces we want. It's not another bureaucratic overlay on the acquisition and on the DOD 5000 process. But there is a lot of goodness to be had when you read that. And a lot of it really is common sense, back to basics approach to arm's length contracting. Figure out what you want, put it out there, put it out there, let American industry figure out how to supply it, and to make them compete. And when you do that, you get good results. And I'll, I'll get to our results in a, mo in a minute, but uh, we have fully embraced better buying power and we're using it. So across the board, you know, our results, it, it's working. Uh, we've got uh, C-130Js, we've got 10 of them now, either operating, under construction, or on contract. We've completed a, a 18 unit run of HC-144s. We, we've completed that program. And we just picked up 14 C-27Js from the Air Force. They're used but good. They're coming out of the desert. Uh, but they're going to be around for another 30 years. They still got to be missionized, so we still got a lot of work to do. Nav Air is working on our missionization plan for them right now. But uh, we picked up the first two, and uh, that's going to take care of us from a fixed wing perspective for about the next 30 years. We're in pretty good shape. Our rotary wing aircraft, we've got uh, just under 150 rotary wing aircraft in the, in the Coast Guard inventory. We've been through a slap and a modernization program that's going to take us out through the next decade. Those helicopters are going to be available to us. So we've really got about 10 years before we have to really start a recapitalization program for our rotary wing aircraft. We've standardized all of our small boats, both our station-based boats 
and our cutter based boats. So they're all up and running now. The GFI to all or GFE to all the new cutters. We use the same boats on all the cutters. So each cutter doesn't have a unique boat anymore. We've got the same boat with the same logistics with the same training infrastructure. And in our cutters, which is where the majority of the money goes, because that's the biggest part of the program, um, we've got seven NSCs. We've delivered four of them. Those are, that's our national security cutter. That's our, our uh, uh, flagship of the fleet. We've got three under construction right now. And whenever we get a budget for FY15, because DHS is still on a continuing resolution uh, through the end of this month, uh, whenever we do get a 15 budget, number eight will be going on contract. That's the complete program of record for the National Security Cutter. And I'll tell you right now, in D.C., there's not many programs that complete the original program of record from start to finish. So we're really proud of that, of being able to get that whole program done. Our FRCs, our fast response cutters, is, it's a 150-foot uh, patrol boat. Uh, they work more inshore. They do the Caribbean. Uh, we've got a program record of 58. We have 30 of them on contract right now. We've got the next two going on contract as soon as we get a budget in uh, 15. And uh, then we'll have 32. And then we're recompeting that contract uh, for the remaining cutters. But that's going very well as, as well. Our current priority is our offshore patrol cutter. That's the uh, mid-size, that's the workhorse of the, of the Coast Guard fleet. That's what's going to be replacing those 50-year-old cutters and those 30-year-old cutters. That's what do, does the original, you know, the, the, the standard Coast Guard mission. That's what collects the drugs that's coming off the coast of the source countries. That's what, uh, that's what we're going to be using to board the time bandit up in the Bering Sea in Sea State 5 conditions. Uh, it's at 25 ship, it's our largest uh, acquisition event, our largest acquisition part of our segment of our program. So it's uh, b making that affordable is our primary concern, and it's probably where I spend the majority of my time right now is making sure that is affordable and we get that acquisition off the ground. Right now we've got three teams in the design competition, and in FY16 we'll be down selected into a single team to do the detailed design and start constructing those ships. So if anybody wants to ask me any questions about the OPC, I'll be more than happy to talk about it. Thank you. Well done. Quick, quick question. Um, my understanding is people are going to be sending in um, questions by emails. All right. I was waiting for that. Very, very nicely. I was looking forward to seeing the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Hearing the Lord. Can I? What, uh, apparently, what we'll do is we'll use the uh, we'll use the microphones, um, and then can I throw off uh, one or two couple quick questions to get the conversation started? Um, a couple of things, when, in, in particularly Admiral Hilarities, when you talked about it, I mean, when I look at, I look at you, I look at it as a budget animal. I, I hate to say it, kind of the way a, a politician looks at pork. And, and you were <laughs> critical to uh, point out, Jim, you're not seeing the whole picture here. Maybe you really start, uh, really start should understanding what I'm really dealing with, what I'm spending, what my missions really are. So uh, kind of so good feedback in terms of what am I not seeing about nav air? What am I really not seeing about nav C? Some of the ship depot type activities. What am I not seeing about spa war? Um, because I think so many of us look at it really as, as a modernization, as an RDT and in procurement. And, and to be honest, sir, I think we're missing 80% of what you're really doing. Yeah, so I, I would tell you that uh, on a daily basis, I spend a lot more time on the aircraft carriers, ballistic missile submarines we got in our public shipyards, and the big deck amphibs and destroyers and cruisers that we've got uh, in the private shipyards overseen by regional maintenance centers. Uh, much, much like buying a car, you go to buy a car, you know what you're getting, you can go to the spec, you can read the sheet, you ask for a car on the second, of, the second Tuesday of next month and the car shows up there. When you take your car to the repair shop, the guy still says, I'll have it for you Tuesday, and calls you on Monday evening and says, I can't get the parts, it's gonna be another week. That, that has not changed in all, all the things we've done to cars have not beaten the variability out of the repair processes. And so, so yes, in fact, that is the, the predominance of the work. It's, uh, it, it's in many ways, we've forgotten many of the things we used to do. Uh, we, we had at the heyday 70 or 80,000 government civilians in the ship repair business we went as low as 20 and realized that we were dramatically under-resourced. And, uh, and so that's a, that's a big part of it. The other is that, and this is one of the principal effects of sequestration from my point of view, is 
Uh, we lose about 1,000 to 1,400 people a year across the four public shipyards just due to attrition. We were frozen on hiring for almost a year, and as a result, that's 1,400 people that are not in the shipyard today that should be. Well, it's only about 500 to do the overhaul of a submarine. So that means three submarine overhauls are going very badly today because of sequestration. And that's not the only reason. There are plenty of other uh, blame to go around. But, but uh, so, you know, your point, there's a lot more to it than just building ships. Uh, and I appreciate that question. Thanks. Um, I, I think he's going for the uh, uh, yeah, Admiral Dunn, can you kind of walk through what am I missing about NAV here? Yeah, I would tell you uh, very much like, well, it's the people. And, uh, you know, we had hiring freezes. We uh, were, were, our fleet is aging. We're taking care of older airplanes. You take care of older airplanes. Oh, by the way, beyond service life, 6,000 hour airplanes, up to eight, going to 10, right? 6,000 hour airplanes, I'll say that again, 6,000 hour airplanes, we designed them to survive that. They did magnificently without any corrosion, without any cracked wing spars, without any cracked bulkheads. You get to 8,000 hours, they start to get tired, and that's a lot of work, and those are the people that you need to hire in your FRCs. And we had the hiring freeze, we had sequestration. We did get sequestered in the Navy uh, depots. Um, so that's on a downward trend with older airplanes because you can't hire. Then let's furlough everybody for a period of time. It was great. I really enjoyed it. And now we're recovering. And uh, it'll take us some time to dig out of that hole because it's a momentous ship that slows way down. And then you got to pick it way back up. And it takes time. Sure. I see we've got a lot of questions from the floor. Was there anybody else that wanted to comment on that first question before we jump to the floor? Lewis is trying to restrain himself. I can see it. No. Okay. No yes, questions. sir. Uh, Bruce Rennie, uh, Navy League, San Diego. Question for Admiral Dunaway. Uh, can you, uh, recently the uh, V-22 was selected for the COD replacement. Can you talk to us about what the schedule timeline is for that to get to the fleet? Uh, so the, that's in the 16 budget, um, which is a proposed, the president's budget. So uh, there's, the really, there is no, timeline for the cod replacement we have plenty of life left on that platform the problem is is that if we're going to jump to the v-22 we want to jump in while that line is hot and this is the discussion that's going on right now it brings a unique set of missions uh, and a different set of mission sets that can come to it you're really talking about a requirements problem that is the cno's purview uh, and as you see that's gone forward um, as a step in that direction now from a syscon's perspective can i do it absolutely you know, is there a technical problem? No, there's not a problem. My real issue is I want to make sure that I get the requirements squared away, that they fully understand what they're getting, that what's compatible with the aircraft carrier, we can get it on and off, which we've already demonstrated, that the flight deck can take the heat, all the things that we're talking about, which I don't see any real problems. And then it mm -hmm. becomes really the CNO's choice, SECNAV's choice, and the requirements problem and where we're headed. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Skip Bowen from Bollinger Shipyard. My question is for Admiral Baffer. Uh, last month at the symposium, the Commandant talked about the huge increase of petroleum products uh, up and down the inland ri river uh, waterways. Uh, any, any word, any movement pushing OMB into giving us some money to uh, recapitalize the inland tender fleet? In, in a word, no. <laughs> The inland tender fleet, you guys chuckled when I talked about 50-year-old cutters. The inland tender fleet's got cutters over 60 years old. I mean, there are some really old ones now. Fortunately, they, for the most part, they've been in fresh water. But uh, the, co the country is seeing an energy renaissance. We're seeing lots of petroleum products coming down freshwater rivers that traditionally haven't seen that kind of traffic. We've got to make sure that we're ready as an organization to handle that kind of flow and to make sure we can respond to a potential oil spill or anything else that may, may occur. Uh, we need to recapitalize our inland tender fleet. We do have a project that started um, where we're looking at initial requirements and we're working with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers on initial designs uh, for what that may look like. Uh, but we don't have anything in our current funding uh, capital asset plan or capital improvement plan uh, for that. Uh, the good news on that one is they're relatively inexpensive. Those are not high technology ships. They're, they're relatively inexpensive, and they can be built in a lot of different places. So should funding occur, it would be relatively easy to solve that problem. Uh, but we don't have anything on the immediate horizon to do that. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm CTN2 Roth from Nyack San Diego with Navy Cyber Unit 23. And this question is for the panel. With the myriad of systems and system of systems with various cyber terrains and different warfare areas, what, will there, uh, what type of training will there be to enable our service cyber protection teams to help defend our naval assets? I'll, I'll take a stab at it a little bit because we do a lot of your training systems. Um, and we're on a precipice now in terms of, so uh, the Naval Air Warfare Center uh, Technical Support Division down in Orlando does a lot of our training training systems. We're on the precipice of learning a lot about intelligent tutoring uh, and gaming. Those two things together bring a whole new facet of tools to young kids like you that this is, we're gonna get in your wheelhouse and figure out how you think and give you training in that direction. Uh, we've done it for the littoral combat ship and that we have an avatar and a rendered environment and people walk through and you talk to the guy and he shows you how to go change the fuel valve on the third deck below and shows you what to tag and not tag and then you do it on your own and if you don't do it right you blow up and go back to the beginning. It's a great way for young people to learn. Uh, you add intelligent tutoring to that and that is where the machine sees how you're learning and shapes the questions for you to send you down paths that you're not doing well on and to get you off paths that you already know. And so that concept of intelligent tutoring is coming to these devices. I think you ought to have training on your phone so that you can see it in Technicolor on many reps and sets and get it in your brain and then we can push you forward. So that is our hope, is to get information into your brains the way you can take the information in your brains faster. Um, so I hope, I'm hopeful that we'll make progress in that direction. I know we have in a lot of regards, but in the cyber world, We've got learning to do before we get there. Yeah, I would just say for the control systems on the ship, uh, we did not uh, build them and necessarily uh, with cyber defense in mind. Uh, the first step, of course, is to use good cyber hygiene. Right? Make sure you don't put plug anything into a, a idle uh, USB port. Uh, ensure that the password's been changed. Also, sort of stuff. So the basic blocking and tackling, so what I'll call cyber hygiene is must do. Most of that's pretty straightforward, but we gotta have training to support. It's gotta be part of the, the, normal, uh, the normal path of getting to your ship. The second then is as we design the new systems, building them such that they take into account that they're not gonna be operated by a PhD necessarily, but operated by somebody who's got six or eight or 10 months of training and so switch positions, uh, uh, the complexities of the system have to be, that, you know, that has to be taken into account how they're designed. And I think we're committed to that path, but we got a lot of work to do. And so in the short term, we'll go work on our cyber hygiene. Thanks. If, if I could, I, I would just expand your question a little bit to not only the training piece of it, but once we get you trained, how are we gonna retain you? Because you know it's almost like special forces. Once you once that type of MOS is trained and we get experts in there, I mean, there's going to be such a high demand not only within the services, I think, but from across industry and everywhere. And and, and we're going to get poached. And you know we're going to have to look at at how we recruit and train and retain, um, and all how we incentivize. So I, I think it's uh, I think it's a much bigger question. It's a good question. I would add also uh, training for the engineers, system designers, uh, builders, commercial industry that's writing most of our code, frankly. It's not enough that the system works. Now it has to work and it needs to be tested in, a, in an attack environment to find out how it can be made to not work. And then it needs to be designed to work in that environment also. Uh, and then uh, extending from that system architecture, system of system design, uh, interfaces are the, uh, frequently the attack surface, like I described earlier. So getting rid of interfaces, uh, or if you have an interface and it's a one-way interface, making it a real one-way interface, and if it has to be a two-way interface, then making it a very hard, uh, defendable two-way interface. So, so uh, I, I look at training on the engineering side and on the design side and then out in industry, and, and it's more than just an awareness, although that's a good start. But the reality is you write a piece of code and then you have to attack it to make sure it's good, solid code. And that's hard to do and requires, a, that's gonna require a while to put that in place. Thank you. 
Yeah, in retrospect, we should probably have asked you that question instead of you us. So, uh, thank, thanks great for that. Great question. Great question. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. It looks like we have enough time for about the last three or four questions. This will be perfect. Good afternoon. Dick Walborn. I'm a retired 06 submariner. Um, we heard at lunch the difficulties that commercial companies have uh, getting into our business. Um, and we all understand how hard that can be. But in an era where our R&D funding is $1.98 and $1.97 of that is going to uh, PORs, um, we desperately need COTS products um, where commercial companies have, in some cases, unlimited R&D funds. Um, example, the music recording industry. Um, all of the iPhones in the world give them all the money in the world and a fickle customer base requires it. They have technology that could revolutionize our sonar signal processing. And I found a company that can do that and they simply laughed when I ask if they would let me help them get into the defense business. Instead, they went to Qualcomm, they're embedded in the new chip, and they'll get very, very wealthy, um, and we lose. So my question is, what can we do uh, <laughs> to get rid of the barriers uh, and, and even more proactively how to make commercial companies feel welcomed to come in and help us with things that are already past the R&D phase and we can use off the shelf. All right, I'll go. Um, so, I, I, you know, like I said, I, I have given up trying to tame the acquisition system because it works well when you're buying something huge and you're going to have to do that. <clears throat> that system is not going to be responsive enough to do the things you're talking about. I believe that the way to get to that is through small businesses, demonstrations, fleet experiments. That's the direction that we can, in fact, get to uh, these small, innovative companies. And we have to find ways to make it easy to get into our combat systems. I go back to my, I need an open architected processor plugged into the outside of my embedded assembly code or C++ coded um, operational flight programs so that I can give them a playground to come and show me their wares. If we can get to that point and we can get the funding for demonstrations and we can find the potentials of it, you know, I, I see 50 technologies a week that just are eye-watering, that we just struggle to find a way to get them into the system because of the acquisition process. So that's the approach we're taking is we're trying to get to where we have open architecture processors on the outside of our existing systems to create security boundaries and you can't, you can't mess with an assembly code um, mission computer. You'll mess it up completely. You have to be able to scab onto the outside of it. And that's the direction that we're headed and trying to open up through our Airworks um, department that I was telling you about. Very good. Yeah, and I would just say in, in, the, in both the submarine combat system <laughs> realm and the surface combat system realm, there are places uh, uh, that have been set up, small businesses encouraged, uh, uh, lab set up that you can go in, you pay your dollar to get the code so that you can develop and then you come in and test it in. Uh, that, that your view is that jaundice uh, worries me because in that, in that area, particularly sonar processing, we, we have, uh, at, at least in our own minds, felt like we've set a pretty good standard there. So I'd like to talk to you afterwards, find out what, uh, kind of where you really found that barrier, so. Great. But not here. Not, not in front of all of us. Oh, no, no, no. Understand. Let me, let me okay. offer. I think, uh, I mean, in the reports I've read and the small businesses I've talked to, the barrier is the uh, administration of a contract, uh, the process to get a contract. That's a very uh, uh, exquisite process. Uh, un unfortunately, it is written in, uh, in law, precedent, court cases. For, there's been a lot of fraud over, I mean, we have 250 years of 
broad. Uh, so, so we like our FAR, Federal Acquisition Regulations, a lot. So the, the point is, how do you exist within the FAR and also innovate? And, and uh, an avenue I, I like that we're exploring is partnering between uh, an established events company, and that's kind of what ARCI is, is take an established company that knows all the rules and can you know, not break the law and partner up with smaller companies that have their thing, uh, and they don't want to do all that stuff. Uh, and, and create avenues and venues to do that. I, I, I think uh, Swiftus now, we used to be RCI, OA, uh, General Dunaway talked about, there are vehicles in place to do that. A lot of it is us being aware of what is what's available out there. So shows like this are great. Conferences like this are great. We can go talk to people, chat with them, and find out, you do that? You can do that? Uh, I've had a couple of those conversations already, as have, uh, I think, everybody up here. And then, and then it's a matter of saying, how, how do I do that? And, uh, and uh, there are, we, we certainly do, with SIBRs, there are mechanisms for small companies to come in direct. Uh, those are available. They're a little bit toned down, but even they're kind of complicated. So, so the one I kind of hot on right now is partnering up uh, between a bigger person that knows the rules and knows the process, and and then bring a a, a a small innovative or commercial company in, and the big guy does the blocking and tackling for the little guy, and the little guy brings us a good product. But we have to know about it, and we have to want to do that, solicit for it, and uh, I think that's there's a venue there for that. I, I well understand that inputs from the trenches are of value, and that's what, what I'm trying to, to do. I've been in the business for years, um, and uh, I can tell you it's hard. There, there are avenues, but the potholes are tremendously deep. So, so certainly what I think we've all been doing is to try to lower those barriers, to recognize that there are innovation opportunities. and, and uh, and the crescendo, I think you're hearing from Navy leadership, is we want that. And, uh, and I think we can do that. If we know about it, at, at my level certainly are these guys that can, can, there are ways of doing that within the process. Nobody goes to jail. Uh, that's important. Uh, you or us. <laughs> and, uh, and still get it done. There's CRADAs, uh, Cooperative Research and Development Agreements. There's a, a way, there's a variety of contracting vehicles, uh, CIBRs. So there are ways to do it. It's finding what's the thing, knowing that there's a thing, and then matching the thing with the process that gets us the thing. And that's the complexity, I think. But I, I would hope and expect that some of those barriers should be coming down. I'm certainly pushing them down. I, I think Evans always pushing them down because we want that. Uh, we recognize we're in a follower mode here and we want to bring that into the Navy. Sir, thank you. I think we have enough time, gentlemen permitting, for, for the last two questions. Uh, yes, yeah, so Scott Kinner with the uh, Marine Corps Tactics and Operations Group, and this is primarily for uh, uh, General Strader. Uh, sir, could you expand on um, you alluded to connectors. Uh, where are we on the connector strategy? Because there's a lot of it's one of those. There's a lot of discussion about it. A lot of drawings. You read Proceedings magazine. There's fancy computer-generated artwork, uh, but we haven't necessarily nailed down. Are we going to try to drive there, swim there, or are we going to get something? Yeah. And, and what's the way ahead on that? Yeah. Thank. Thank you for the question. I. I think. Um, the short answer to your question is, is we're in the requirements phase. We're in the exploratory requirements phase. CD&I, our, our combat development integrators, um, are, are fully engaged. Um, they're looking across the spectrum to see what's, what's in the realm of the possible right now, and then they're also forward-looking. I, I think, you know, I talked about um, ACV 2.0, the high water speed piece of that program. Um, it's also looking, you know, into the connectors, um, into the connector piece of EF21. You know, I, I really can't give you much more than that right now. Not, not really involved in it heavily at Marine Corps Systems Command. It's, it's still in the requirements development phase. So if, if I tried to go further, it'd just be speculation and pontification. So I'll, I'll help you out maybe just a little bit. Uh, in fact, uh, I heard the discussion at lunch a little shout out to our, our uh, friends at Textron. We are in production mm -hmm. on the replacement LCAC. Mm -hmm. It's called the Ship to Shore Connector. The second vehicle is under construction now. The first one's uh, as well along. Uh, that, that will replace the LCAC fleet. 
simplify the, the vessel, make it, uh, I think, more reliable and maintainable, uh, but while maintaining about the same form factor. So I, I think that's going to be a great program. So that we are moving out on some of the connectors, and that, that program is, is moving out smartly. Good afternoon, Lieutenant Jeff Padilla, Coast Guard Headquarters. Are the services acquiring or contracting 3D We can't hear you. Are the services acquiring or contracting 3D printing technologies which could potentially bridge some cost gaps for old material repair parts or re-engineer existing material into new capabilities? So I will tell you that we have a two 3D printers at Marine Corps Systems Command. We use them in our in our uh, S&T and integration section at the headquarters level. Um, you know, we'll take ideas from the field, from the fleet, from the operating forces with everything from uh, a new collapsible M4 stock to all manner of things, and, and they'll take it, design it, print it. Um, so we, we are using 3D printers to, to help uh, with Innovate. So the answer to your question is yes, we're, we're using it. Uh, I know uh, SSC Pacific is working, uh, the, uh, using uh, 3D printers, uh, taking a look at old parts, exactly like Admiral Dunner was describing, but not just rep replicating the old part, actually making a prototype and then modifying it in order to fit in the new place uh, that it's supposed to go. And they've done a, several demonstrations. I think that's... Uh, very productive. So it's not just replicating the old part, it's adding some new stuff to the old part, using a printer uh, to, to print the original part, and then print the new part and prototype it in place. So that's one thing I know is happening. Uh, I'll, I want to do some speculation. I think when I go on a DDG, I've built DDGs for years, and you go down in, a, you know, in the supply storerooms, there are acres of Vidmar cabinets that are full of washers and O-rings. Uh, we have every size of washer and O-ring you can imagine, except the one you need. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I just look at that, and you open a drawer, and there are 50 O-rings and washers of different sizes. And it just, just to Dave Lewis, it seems like you could replace all of those with a printer that makes washers and O-rings. So, so what we're actually working on on that context, though, is, is when, you, when you print something, uh, one, a complex uh, alloy is very, very difficult today, almost impossible to maintain the alloy properties as you print it. So something that's pure aluminum, pure rubber, probably can print it. How do you go then say it's good enough to go in a system? Right. So right now our supply system, when they give you a part, that part's the right part, at least it should be if you put it in the right cabinet, uh, and, and it's weld properties to be sad and it's sealing properties to be sad. We're actually working on how to go accredit a part that's been printed just like you would that comes off a standard production line. So to me, that's the blocking and tackling that will ultimately make what, what Dave said possible, printing those things out instead of uh, stocking them all on board. So, but you got to do the basics, uh, and that's the most important part, I think, at this point. I think that's we concentrate on the high end, super complicated stuff, and, and uh, I think some of that simple stuff. I mean, a washer is not structural normally, and even if it's there for a couple of weeks or a couple of months till you get somewhere where you can get the washer, I think there's value. In that. So, so we're taking on a little bit of different approach. I talked about the digital thread. I want to catalog every part with the digital thread that has the three-dimensional drawing with the metadata behind it so we have it in archives forever and ever and ever. And I don't, uh, we'll do the business case on whether it's an additive or a subtractive manufactured par product. If it's additive manufactured, I want to be able to replicate in an airworthy fashion a part. So airworthy flight critical part is the, that's what I'm working on. And it's going to take us about two and a half more years to get to where we can do A, airworthy flight critical part. I got to be able to do thousands. <clears throat> so we're trying to get all the variability out of the system because industry is changing machines every week. <laughs> the materials are changing, and it's going to take us some time to get to where we can repeat it and make them airworthy. And as soon as the Navy gets this <laughs> figured out, we're right with them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank On you. that note, well spoken, sir. On that note, please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>